to settle down, we're going to uh, um, uh, finish the day with the final session, which has got a sort of shift in focus. It's great, a symposium uh, organized in David's interests because that's uh, sort of almost like all interesting things. Um, so uh, there's a shift in focus now. Well, not a shift in focus. We've already heard earlier a little bit about computational biology, but uh, we've got uh, another of Oliver's, uh, uh, sorry, of David's students, Oliver Stegel, who's now a um, group leader at uh, EBI. But I also want to give a bit of a historical perspective of how we got where, where we are right now. So I did my PhD in inference group between 2005 and 2009. And at the time, the inference group was an extremely diverse research environment. We had on the order of, I think, there were six PhD students, each of us working on completely different topics, ranging from computational biology to information processing systems, human computer interface systems. And this diversity was not only between each one of us, but it's also sort of within our PhD theses. So actually, I just try here to draw a little bit of a tree what, what the path I took. I started actually in something completely different I ended up later on. I, I talked about what was interesting, quantum information theory and error and codes. I started a bit of work with David that unfortunately or fortunately didn't, didn't lead to anything in my case. But then later on got interested in Gaussian processes, approximate inference. Carl Rasmussen's work was very influential. The book just came out around at the time. And there was this converging theme that computational biology was a really exciting application to bring together many of the research themes that were going on at the time. So computational biology, we went on to genetics on the one hand, and then most recently, and that's work that we're now doing at the EBI, it, to single cell biology. And what I want to do now in the next maybe half an hour or so is, is mainly focus on, on this topic here at the right, which is one of the core interests I have at the moment, but also highlight how that links to all these other elements, computation, biology, matrix decomposition, and how, in a way, everything is connected, and, and how the diverse, diversity in the group and the work we did, and also the diversity of the connections that David enabled, sort of led to this different, different aspect. And, um, and I'm also very grateful for David for making that possible and, 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 and supporting this diverse research. And I can just second all the other speakers who basically said, thinking outside the box and everything is science, is sort of one of the key messages that we all took away from. I also quickly want to acknowledge everybody else that I don't have, um, who are not directly involved with the science I'm going to talk about. So the main scientific project is Florian Büttner, who is a close correlation. He's in my group right now. I've been working on this single cell variation. But there are also many other people I would like to acknowledge. Neil Lawrence, John Wynne, Leo Parts, and Richard Urban, who've been all connections that have happened through the inference group in one way or another. And I, I briefly want to talk through some of the historical elements, too, so how we got there what we did in the end, how we got to modeling molecular variation, and why did we think that is an interesting problem to solve, and then later on I'll, I'll really go into the main topic of the talk. So at the time, that was roughly 2007, that started with an internship with John Wynne. We were interested in, in also disentangling, very similar to the problem Brandon was mentioning, this sort of genotype-phenotype map. The approach we took in was a slightly different. At the time, deep learning was not available. But rather, the idea is GVAS linking individual genetic variants in correlative signals. We're looking at individuals that have one allele versus another that may be linked to different outcomes in phenotype. And augmenting these types of data by other molecular intermediates that may actually explain the reasons why a particular variant in the genome is causing disease, say. And one of the data that's available at the time was particular mRNA gene expression levels, which we started to get handle on on the order of hundreds of samples. At the time, the scales were hundreds of individuals, millions of variants. That's roughly what the genotyping chips back then resolved. And we were trying to understand, can we solve this intermediate layer, which is also called EQTL mapping, to perhaps then interpret the greater problem of linking genotype to phenotype. So that wasn't an easy task. And if you think about the numbers, it becomes clear very, very quickly. And one of the main challenges is if you just think about linking any possible variant in the human genome, as I said back then, was millions of variants. Now we, I think, talking more about tens and hundreds of millions of variants if you just limit ourselves to common variants, the hypothesis space is just enormous. We're talking about 10 to the 10 different hypotheses of linking every single variant that is imaginable to every single molecular trait. So multiple testing is a fundamental burden that limits these analysis. We also have troubles with false positive associations because these data are not perfect, and there's lots of structure in the data, and you'll, you'll get to see that um, just in a moment. So leaning back, and again, being exposed to thinking from the inference group, we felt, well, the right thing to do is to reduce dimensionality. If you want to use latent variable models, 
And, and preparing this talk, I, I found these two papers on the inference group webpage from David McKay and James Miskin. I think these are actually the first applications that I have seen that use latent variable models to model gene expression data. And there's still some of the examples of the hidden treasures that you can still find up until today um, at, at the inference group webpage. So how does it look in our case? Well, the, the, prop, the, the principle is very simple. We take our gene expression data, which is sort of a matrix of individuals times genes. Um, at that time, there were definitely more genes than individuals. That has changed. And we decompose that matrix into a component that's low rank, where you have a, a smaller number of factors for every individual and a regulatory weight matrix that tells you how do these factors regulate individual genes. Or pictorially, you assume that the mRNA abundance changes, gene expression levels, that's an old picture I just copied from my thesis, they are actually driven by these latent variables in the middle that you do infer via a latent variable model. That could be ICA, PCA, fact analysis, or so forth. And then you're testing for association within each of those environments in the genome to these latent variables instead of the, the output of the expression levels. So the fundamental hope we had at the time, though this may increase power, and maybe also interpretation of understanding these linkages instead of, instead of looking at single genes. But unfortunately, that didn't quite pan out. Actually, what this model was most useful for was looking at the residuals, which was a surprise in retrospect that makes much more sense. Um, I'm just showing here you an example how that looked in practice. This is one particular gene, chromosome 7. Again, this is very, very old data by now. We're looking here at local variants in the vicinity of the gene. That's a megabase upstream dumption of the gene and testing each one of these variants for linear correlation to the transcript changes. So that's basically a linear model. We're fitting that model for every single variant and asking the question, how much better do we explain the expression changes with this variant included versus without? So that's a likelihood ratio of, of these two models or model comparison we're carrying out. So you can see if you just do that naively, you don't find any association. However, once you adjust for these hidden factors, in this case, that's really just the residuals from a fact analysis model, you suddenly see this beautiful cis effect coming up. This is a change in, in abundance of that gene that is correlated to variants in the vicinity. And that's pretty good evidence that this is really a regulatory effect. Maybe these variants sit in gene promoter or, or, or something else. So this idea of accounting for background, accounting for context, solving the function phenotype equal genotype plus something and inferring that something, that idea later on took off. And there's a second brief um, episode I want to mention, which is a nice collaboration that later on happened with Neil Lawrence, where we took that principle further and asked generally the question, well, if you want to associate a variant in the genome to a particular phenotype, let's say the abundance of a particular gene, we would like to account for all the other sources of variation that drive variability in gene expression. That might be non-genetic variations, such as environmental factors and batch, and that's precisely what these principal components capture, many technical facts. But there might be also genetic factors, and one of these examples, for example, population structure, where some individuals come from a population one and two, there might be also cryptic relatedness and so forth. And one of the key tools that turned out really be useful for this is actually a Gaussian process model. So we don't account for fixed effect residuals, but rather we ask the question, how much better does a model that includes the variant explain the transcriptome variability compared to a model that has a background effect, which is actually explained by a covariance matrix, and that covariance matrix is a sample by sample covariance that captures these source of variations, such as population structure or variations that we induce from these gene expression data themselves, i.e. they're non-genetic. So these sort of approaches, they worked out quite well. We increased power. This is one of the examples from a, a thousand genomes paper a few years ago. We are looking basically at the number of genes for which we can ascertain a genetic basis, where we know what are the variants that drive gene expression changes, where we can make regulatory interpretations, either with or without accounting for these confounding factors. And there, there's quite a bit of mileage in, in, in doing so, in explaining away the residuals. So that sort of research theme has actually stayed with us for, for quite a while. We've been working on principles like that, accounting for non-ID sample structures and latent variables in population genetics, regulatory genomics. We have now also very exciting methods where we can link variants in the genome to downstream consequences in trends. Not the immediate hits of a variant is in the gene promoter, but really understanding what happens at the level of pathways. And perhaps the most recent and most interesting um, innovations have been happening here on the right-hand side in, in single-cell biology. And that's what I really want to talk about now. And that, that's very new work. That, that we are pursuing. And, and later on, at the very end, I want to make the link between this field and very briefly, at least, a regulatory genomics between people. So single cell profiling is, is, is mainly enabled by technologic advances. So classical transcriptome profiling, gene expression profiling, and assaying typically used to look at gene expression estimates derived from bulk populations of hundreds of thousands of cells. So by doing so, we can compare difference between one person and another, but we're missing much of the details of what happens in one cell versus another cell, 
and the variation is, is averaging out many of the factors that are actually relevant if you think about intracellular variation. Single cell transcriptome profiling fixes this problem. Initially, there was a technology advance using the fluidome system. That's a microfluidics device that enabled this profiling, but there are now many, many other methods available to do so. And that allows to drill down to a single cell resolution where we can ask questions about how do cell types emerge? What are subcell types? How do these cell types change in dynamic processes in development, for example, differentiation processes, and so forth? But at the same time, there's almost also this enormous new world of hidden factors and latent variables to be discovered. And one of the examples, for example, is cell cycle. Cell cycle, they divide. Cells might be stressed, there might be apoptosis, there might be all sorts of things going on at the single cell level that we need to account for in order to understand the variation in these data. And here's a cartoon of uh, one of the examples we discovered while working on these data, and that is really looking at differentiation of, of T cells from a naive state to a TH2 cells. You don't need to know what that process really means, but the key idea is every dot here is a cell, we want to order these cells based on a marker gene, and the marker gene here is GATA3 expression. So GATA3 is a typical canonical T cell differentiation marker where GATA3 low cells are naive and GATA3 high cells are differentiated cells. And now the challenge in studying these cells, if we want to order them, is that each of these cells has other properties attached to, and one of them is the cell cycle. So the cells might be in G1, S, and G2M. These are different phases in the replication cycle of these cells. And the challenge is that because of these two processes occurring at the same time, the actual expression profile that we're seeing looks very, very different than this idealized picture at the top. In fact, if you were to order cells based on these data, we would come to very different answers than if you use these sort of cartoonized, idealized data set here at the top. So what you can see is that we actually we really need to get handle on this middle layer. And, and the advantage or the difficulty is that this layer is actually not even measured. We don't typically assay a cell cycle in this experiment. And that's a classic example of a latent variable you want to esti estimate from data to then clean your observed expression data to something that looks more like what you have here at the top. So the main work I'm talking about is this paper here. I, I want to also briefly acknowledge the people involved. So Florian Büttner was really fantastic to have around the lab, and we've been closely working on this topic and still working on this topic. There's also many people at EBI and Sanger, John Marioni, Sarah Teichmann, who've been really instrumental in making that possible. So what we're doing in practice, we're taking the differentiation process here at the top that we might want to study and all the other variations in between that we are regarding as nuisance. And the idea is we want to fit one of these background models that I talked about before, especially covariance matrix explains how similar are any two cells in terms of all the variations we do not care about. So in other words, high red colors mean two cells are in a similar cell cycle stage or in a similar apoptotic state. And once we have this covariance matrix, we can adjust for expression data by taking out that variation and then do all the things we want to do in single cell biology, primarily understanding subpopulations of cells, understanding variation in gene regulatory networks, or understanding what are the sources of variation, what drives variability between single cells. So the key idea we're using is that the transcriptome is not just a, a block of matrix. We don't have just cells and genes, but we have very good information about which part of the transcriptome are good proxies for the process of interest. So for example, if you're interested in the cell cycle, there are many cell cycle genes on the order of 700 or so. They're obviously not consecutive, but I'm reordering here for illustrative purpose. And then we can fit a latent variable model just using these indicative markers that are good proxies for the cell cycle. So what we technically do is effectively assume these genes are all independent if you just assume that we can condition on a suitable covariance matrix. The covariance matrix is exactly this picture that I've shown you before. So basically, it's a similarity between any pairs of cells. And we assume a low rank structure. Actually, it's rank one, for those who are interested. And the model is very similar to actually performing PCA on that slice of the transcriptome. And basically, this matrix is similar to the first principal components in its outer product. Or another term to use that, that's a Gaussian process latent variable model. Neil Lawrence really inspired us to think about these models in this context. So in single cell biology, there's a challenge that I at least want to mention briefly, and it's technical variability. Because we start with very tiny amounts of starting material, few molecules of RNA per cell, we need to account for this variation that is likely to occur due to technical reasons. So one of the ways to get a handle on that that we hear borrow from um, Simon Anders and, and, and John Marioni to use this principle, I think it's one of the first ones, is to use synthetic spikins that are available in each one cell at the same concentrations. So each one of those 92 dots here you see is a synthetic RNA molecule, and they're spiking at the exact same concentration in every single cell. So in principle, there shouldn't be any variation because it's identical between all cells. But if you look at the coefficient of variation, you can see that particularly those which are low abundant here on the left have a very substantial coefficient of variation. And that's purely due to technical reasons. There's no reason why they should be varying in principle. 
Now you can use this principle to then make predictions for all the other genes that you're actually interested in. So this is your actual transcriptome and, 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 and have an estimate of the expected coefficient of variation that is likely to occur due to technical reasons. And we propagate information in our models um, in, in suitable ways. So I quickly want to mention that this is actually a unique opportunity because we have a latent variable that we can actually validate. And one way we validated that is to ask the question, well, if we estimate a good cell cycle covariance that really captures the cell cycle, we should be able to do an ANOVA model. And that ANOVA model should really tell us what's happening in the cell cycle. So we fit this ANOVA for every single gene. There's a mean term. There's a component of variance with the cell cycle. There's other variation that we don't know about that might be biology that we care about and are interested in. And there's this technical variation that we get from the spike in, as I just mentioned. And now to validate this model, we had the fortunate opportunity to have a data set at hand from Sarah Teichmann's lab where we had actually cell staged for the cell cycle. So here we have 300 cells where we know in which cell cycle stages they're in. We know what is the ground truth, which cells are G1, which are S, and G2N. And now what we can do is we compare the estimates of our model that you will hopefully see soon on the right. So every dot here is a gene. This is the proportion of variance explained by the cell cycle according to model-based estimates that doesn't know which cell cycle stage the cells are in. That's really just using the transcriptome of these marker genes to a simple ANOVA here on the y-axis, where we effectively use the known labels that are derived from Hux staining that's based on DNA content to understand whether there's concordance. And there's a reasonably good linkage to, as to, to suggest that really we capture something that is likely to be uh, specific to the cell cycle. And this is a latent variable we get a handle on, and we know that it's really capturing the process of interest. I briefly want to mention that we can also look at the model residuals. So that's regressing out the model component. You can see that the structure of the cell cycle disappears, which is it's one of the main applications of these approaches to remove the variability that we may not be interested in. I want to go back to this T cell differentiation example. So here we were looking at cells that differentiate from this naive population to this TH2 population. And one of the questions was, well, how bad is the cell cycle actually? How much variation does this biological, fundamental biological process explain at the single cell level? And one of the surprising answers is actually explains a lot of variability. What I'm doing here is we're ordering genes by the proportion of variance that is due to non-technical variation. I mentioned earlier on this technical factors is one of the main challenges. This is light blue component. This is the density of genes. And what I'm doing here is looking at genes that have 0 to 10% technical variation to other genes that basically have no technical variation. But you can see whenever there is non-technical variation here, either in orange or, or purple, the orange component, which the cell cycle is actually dominating. To put numbers on this, we have more than 40% of the genes where the cell cycle derives 30% of the variation or more. And if you compare this to the, to the biological variation, the ratio is even much worse. So really, cell cycle is a, is a dominant driver of heterogeneity in these populations of cells. Now, that variation has consequences. For example, you're interested typically in understanding cell subpopulations. You want to know what happens in these populations of cells. And that's a typical PCA-style plot. Actually, this is, again, a nonlinear PCA using a GPLVM model. And here, this is every dot is a cell. You see on unadjusted data, there's no structure really occurring. But once you account for the cell cycle process, you do see two subpopulations that are clearly visible and differentiable. And once we look into this more closer, we actually recover the picture I've shown in the beginning, where the left population is gutter 3 low, and the right population is gutter 3 high, really suggesting that we're capturing these dynamics of cells at different stages different during the differentiation dynamics. And it's not only gutter 3 that's differentially expressed. There's a whole lot of canonical T cell differentiation markers. We're very certain that this model does what it's supposed to do. So this was one example. And let's go to start it, that really at the single cell level, we might be interested to explain suitable latent variables. But as you may have noticed, this is a very simplistic model. We just looked at one process, cell cycle. And, and that is not in general enough, right? You might have many other things going on. I mentioned already earlier on this differentiation process. There might be another gene set that captures this variation, what happens at, the, at this level of differentiation. There might actually be other biological process we don't know about. There might be confounding factors of technical source of variation. And we would like to really account for all of these properties in our data set and perhaps get an unbiased estimate. We don't know a priori that cell cycle drives variability. So there, there is certainly need for doing something more comprehensive than this. So what we're doing in practice now is we use a similar decomposition approach of this matrix of gene expression data. One component might be the cell cycle. And again, the idea is this is the activation or the loading of these individual cells in terms of the cell cycle process. And there's a regulatory way that tells you how, at which genes is this, is this cell cycle process active. And there's a prior belief that's particularly these blue genes and not these other genes. And if you have another process, you might get a similar picture. Here's again a one-dimensional uh, factor representation, and there's another gene set that is indicative for this process. 
But in general, we could have in this model more than hundreds of processes. And there are many, many databases where you can get suitable gene sets from factors that tells you what are the genes that are driving these factors. For example, from reactome databases, core molecular signal databases, and, and everything that's out there in the prior knowledge of biology. In addition, we also include this factor that actually captures broad effects. So this is a one-dimensional latent variable that has an effect on all genes. And there's previously a lot of evidence that these things are typically confounding factors. That comes again from work that we and others have done. Um, Story and Leek have looked at this and also uh, asked previously that these broad factors that affect many, 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 many genes, they're typically everything else but, but biology you do care about. And what we then do is we fit this model all in one joint fashion. So here is this again in formula. We look at an additive model where the expression matrix is explained by the sum of all of these factors. There's a latent variable X that drives activation. And then the weights have two components. There's on the one hand this sparsity prior that tells you what are the gene sets that are regulated. And it's basically a Bernoulli coin flip variable that is biased in terms of which gene sets we have prior information on that are present. But it's only bias. It's not static. And then there's a regulatory weight which tells you what's the regulatory potential up or down of any one of these genes. There's a combination of an ARD prior, actually, and a, and a, and a slap its back prior on, on these data to basically have these two levels of sparsity. On the one hand, you want to know which genes are regulated by each process. On the other hand, you want to know which pros are actually present in your data set, which ones are present, and explain variability. So this is uh, looking how this works out in practice. This is exactly the same ESL data set I mentioned earlier. These are all the processes on the x-axis. And you can see, if you look at the relevance of these processes, they're almost all zero. You know, the model really identifies a small number of variables that seem to drive heterogeneity. And one of the key processes coming up is G2M checkpoint, which is related to the cell cycle. There's another one, P53 pathway, which is not surprising because these are pluripotent cells. And what I want to quickly show is that we can use these latent variables also to visual visualize cells in two-dimensional representations. For example, here, what I'm plotting is P53 pathway versus G2M checkpoint. And you can see, again, using the coloring of known cell cycle stages, that cells in this G2M phase are actually separated from the other cells. So really, this latent variable that this model picks up, and again, a priori, this model doesn't know that these cells cycle. We don't impose a priori that cell cycle variation is present. It really picks up a latent variable that does what it's supposed to do, while this P53 pathway is, for example, not discriminating between the cell cycle stages. We can even use this one variable to predict which cells and which cell cycle stage reasonably accurately, but that's perhaps not so interesting here. So what's exciting in single cell biology is now we have this trade-off with new protocols that are becoming available between cell count, how many cells we can profile, and, and sequencing depth. So the level of detail we can ascertain these transcription profiles. One of the main technology advances here is the, from Akoska et al. is drop seek protocols and others developed that abroad, where effectively the whole single cell process is multiplexed in high throughput using droplet-based protocols and barcoding, which allows you to, in parallel, process large numbers of cells. And what it does is gives you the full flexibility to look either at small numbers of cells and profile them very deeply. That's basically a function of your sequencing budget. Or looking at few or large numbers of cells and, and going to low coverage sequencing data sets. For example, this data set here looked at 44,000 individual cells that come from a retina expand. And here this is a map of the cell types that can be discovered from these data sets. You can really look at fine-grained resolution about what are the sub-cell types and the cell types present in somatic tissues using these types of data. Now, if you think about applying the model I just described you to these types of this data set, there's one problem, which is scalability. That might be not exciting news for this audience, but really, in many models in computational biology, they still have quadratic and cubical scaling with the number of samples. So we needed a model that scales linear in the number of cells, and, and that's what, what we now can do using variational inference and approximation methods. And this model can now run in luckily three hours on a normal laptop. So you can really look at large scale data sets with hundreds of thousands of cells to, to process these latent variables and get this information. A second challenge was related to this trade off between depth and cell counts. And typically, these large data sets have low sequence in depth. In other words, our observed data here at the bottom has, has lots and lots and lots of zero counts, which actually don't have any biological meaning. <laughs> Zeros mean it's likely that the abundance is low, but it by no means that the abundance is really zero, simply because we're undersampling the space so dramatically. So what we do in practice is introduce another layer of latent variables, effectively use this entire model described earlier on a latent space of expression counts that we have not observed, that we model statistically, and link those to the observations where there's a, a likelihood model that either says, yes, if I have information, I use it. If I don't have information, then I model explicitly that I do have a, a prior belief that the abundance is low, but it's by no means zero. What this model also allows you to do is to basically look at this imputed space here. And once you have this imputed space, you can also regress the residuals. You can say, I want to have an expression data set 
where, for example, hidden confounding factors or other variation of the cell cycle are removed. And, and that's a very powerful tool to interrogate different aspects of these single cell transcriptome data sets and look at variation that, that, that otherwise is, again, masked by other processes that you might not be interested in. I want to briefly illustrate this on these data set here. This is now, again, the relevance of different factors. These are 387 factors coming from Reactome. That's one of the largest databases of molecular processes, hosted EBI. And when you zoom in here, the top factors, you can see that one of the major drivers is this hidden factor. This is what we think is confounding variation that is not biological, that really affects many, many, many genes. And in, in these data, that's a very, very dominant factor. There's also very general processes that are coming up here. And I think general processes make sense in this case because we look at an average of tens of thousands of cells that have all sorts of different functions. So that is very non-surprising that you have a very broad function. But what's more interesting is to look at a subset. Here we're looking at six cell types. This is, a, again, a two-dimensional representation of these 2,000 cells. This is the cell types the authors visualized and, and classified using exactly the same model as in T as an EMAP. And now what is quite exciting, we can now take these data and say, let's regress out all these hidden factors, all these factors that we think are not biological. When we do that, we actually do see many new subpopulations appearing. These populations splits up, this population splits up. This population of astrocytes splits in two very distinct subpopulations that previously not become visible. Astrocytes fulfill many functions. Biologically, it's very sensible that there are subpopulations that have different uh, functionality, and we do see this from our single cell transcriptome data. We can also, in this subset of cells, ask the question again, what are the, the, the processes that differentially express between these, these two cell populations? And again, um, this makes sense. We see TCA cycle, and the Krebs cycle is known to be implicated in, in astrocyte regulation. Um, so without being um, by any means a, an expert in this particular field of astrocytes, we do think that the populations we pick up, they, they do make sense and reflect biology. But it's very interesting. We can also look at the processes that are active in the subset population. And here we do see different processes coming up, ADP signaling and, and class B secretin family receptors. What we can now do is we can visualize the cells in this space of these factors. So again, it's basically like a PCA where you have access labels, which is a very, very unique situation in biology that you know what do these, these dimensions mean. And what we can observe is that particularly these two populations that we identify, they're also differentially expressed for ADP signaling. And it's again a process that's previously implicated in, in, in um, astrocytes and in regulation together with TCA cycle. So really, by you looking at latent variable models, we can infer processes information that we don't observe in the data sets that are not visible just by looking at the raw readouts. And I want to spend the next few minutes to really tell a little bit where this field is going and where single cell genomics is heading in the future, what we are excited about. And one of the main areas is that we're now able to not only look at RNA-seq transcriptome variation, but we look, can look also at other modalities at the single cell level. So with Wolf Reich and colleagues who recently devised methods to take a single cell and physically separate the DNA from the RNA. And this physical separation can then be followed on by, by sulfur treatment on the DNA, which gives you an idea of DNA methylation and a typical epigenetic readout that complements transcriptome variation very well. And we can do transcriptome profiling of the same cell. So we get sort of two types of matrices. On the one hand, gene expression variation for all of the single cells and DNA methylation for each of the single cells. That allows you to then look at intercorrelations at the single cell level. For example, one example I want to show here, that's a pluripotency regulator in ES cells, where we can look at single cell heterogeneity. So every dot here is a single cell, and asking how methylated are these cells in these genomic regions. This is a small region of this one single gene here. What you can see, there are many regions where either all cells are methylated or unmethylated, but there are also regions where these cells take different faith, where they change their methylation status. For example, here's a region where many cells are unmethylated, others are methylated. And this heterogeneity methylation is actually linked to transcriptome output. So here we do see that these cells here that are highly methylated have low expression of ESRB, whereas the genes that are lowly methylated have high expression. So there's really functional relationships at these single cell levels um, that we can disentangle using these types of methods. Um, with this, I would like to summarize the, the main part of the talk. I, I think I wanted to share that there are many exciting technological advances that are now allow assaying molecular variation at the single cell level. We can, we can not only compare tissues and people, we can compare one cell from another. We can, we can take an entire organ, dissolve it, and look at single cell resolution. What do these cells do? And having this data at hand really requires new methods that allow interpreting this variation. And latent variable models are very powerful for do so. We can decompose variation. We can use prior gene sets to put labels on what these latent variables are. That we capture both biological processes and many technical variations, which is very expected and typical in many biological processes. And by adjusting for some of these confounding factors, we can also really piece out new biology that previously is, is not visible. <laughs>
and, and I want to finish here, perhaps relating back to, to Brandon's talk, that really, initially we looked at differences be between people and linking genotype to phenotype, whether they're molecular or end phenotypes and population level variation. We now have a handle on doing very, very similar things at the single cell level. We can link genetic differences of single cells to transcriptional differences or epigenetic differences to transcriptional differences. And the next step ahead will be to use single cell genomics as a phenotyping tool and, and profile many, many individuals and see how these two worlds interlink. How does genetic differences, the makeup of people, change single cell dynamics, the decomposition of cell types, and so forth. And that will be an exciting area ahead. Thank you. Questions? It's nice to see acknowledgement that physiology is actually very important in gene regulation. Um, to what extent are people looking at uh, physiological variables per se and trying to understand those dynamics? Because even within a population of cells that have identical genomes, you have very interesting interactions and lots of latent variables that are important for just understanding the physiology. And of course, it's the physiology in the end that determines uh, what the organism does and the state of its health and so on. Yeah, it's a very good, it's a very good question. I mean, really, context um, is, 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 is here the key word. And we're trying to get, starting to get a handle on what are these different context variables. One of them are cell types. Another one is obviously communication between cells and physiological properties. Um, are only now beginning to emerge where people look at physiological difference between cells, stimulating cells, and, and so forth. So I think that that's now starting. The field has been many years now in technological development, and, and now the, the basic principles are established, and the applications are really now becoming uh, possible, I think. Um, in the context of your, uh, the factors that you discovered for the single cell data, have you thought about how you can validate whether those are, are are sort of meaningful causally in the context of genetics? Like have you thought about different kinds of perturbation experiments or genetics yeah. data you could look at to do yeah. that? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, you, you made, we made that point, which is uh, well taken, that we should look at mechanism and causal aspects. And I think in, in this example of the cell cycle, we had the opportunity to validate one factor. You could obviously say you want to do the same thing for every single context, but it's obviously very difficult um, to do this systematically in a, in a principled manner on large scale. So I think actually, the keyword that you brought up, genetics, is, is exactly what we need to look at. Genetic variation is a powerful anchor to understand causation, and that, that's why it's so exciting to look at cells from genetically diverse people, because that gives you a handle on genome is the cause of everything downstream, and, and that will allow us to, put a, to validate the labels we've put on these factors, I think. That's how I want to put it. Well, so uh, we've got a bit of time, so I'll ask a question as well. Um, uh, what about combining some of the techniques that uh, Brendan was talking about in terms of a pre-processing step? Uh, is that something that uh, you've thought about or are planning to do? Yeah, I think it's an, it's, it's, an, it's an excellent question. So we've been looking at similar sort of very explanatory regulatory models using deep learning and other aspects to understand heterogeneity. And you know, one question is whether you have DNA-related aspects in the sequence, in DNA sequence that are predictive of methylation heterogeneity, for example. We have looked at this at the moment. There is, there is some weak signal, but it's, it's, it's very little. And I, I think it's, it's not unexpected, particularly in the epigenetic world. I mean, this is the classical layer that goes beyond what, what is encoded in the DNA. But there will be a component that is genetic. And I think the most exciting elements are interaction effects, that you do see aspects on particular molecular outputs given other molecular states which are mediated by the presence or absence of genetic variants. So I think that is one area where, where genetics certainly will come into play and, and powerful models of one can do. Yes. Okay, if we can just thank uh, Oliver again. Um, so there's another interesting connection with some of what Oliver was talking about with latent variable models, because my own work on that was also partially inspired by David's work on density networks. Um, so uh, it all ties back in. It says that's, that's loopy belief propagation, right? That there's a source node, and then uh, it comes out in two different ways. Okay. So